with Jordan Peele. All right, so as you can tell by the title, I'm going to see the Us movie premiere, well not premiere, a private screening at Howard because, you know, I go to the best HBCU and we got in contact with the director, Jordan Peele, and he agreed to having a private screening here at Howard at Crampton Auditorium. And it's at five o'clock today, so I'm literally about to go over now because it's almost four and doors open at four. Whew, that was a lot to say, I can't breathe. All right. But about the ticket situation, oh my goodness. So tickets came out on Monday and the doors didn't open until 10 a.m. But people were out there since like six in the morning. It was crazy, yeah. So originally I wasn't even gonna go early to get a ticket. I was like, you know what? I pay money to go to these classes. Like I'm not about to skip to get a free ticket when I can just leave class like 15 minutes early. That was my original plan. For some reason, I was like, you know what? I'm not gonna do that. I'm just gonna go. 8.40, I ended up going to Crampton and there was already so many people. Long story short, a girl passed out. Another girl had an asthma attack. Like, it was insane. Like, people were literally going crazy for free tickets. So, if you ever come to Howard and you're trying to, you know, get tickets for an event that's really popular, it's real out here. Be careful. So, anyway, I'm about to start walking over now and I heard there's already a line, so... We'll see how that goes. All I know is I'm getting in the front regardless. I don't care what I have to do. I'm getting in the front, period. Okay, so as I was getting ready to leave, I realized I didn't say this one part, which was really dumb of me because this is the most important part. But um, Lupita Nyong'o, Winston Duke, and Jordan Peele are actually going to be here. They're doing a Q&A after the movie. So that's why a lot of people were like bugging out because obviously why would you not want to be able to meet them? Y'all look at this line. This shit is mad long. The door is just open. This shit is trash. Trash. Oh y'all haven't seen me in so long. Come to the people. I was like, hey, we all just struggling right now. Hey, I'm happy. It's about to start in like 20 minutes. We're really hyped, you know, we got some good seats. We finessed. But yeah, so the next time you're gonna see us is when they start doing the question and answer. Oh my God, people are looking. I'm getting really self-conscious. I'm gonna turn this off, bye. Specifically about race because 
you know, I want. I knew after Get Out, people would be looking to uh, dissect the race in that in this movie, um, and, and how it's addressed. This this movie is about duality and this idea that every time, however we define the word us, for there to be an us, there has to be a them. And I think one of the reasons this movie has a more, uh, has an expanding and expansive element to it, where you can kind of apply it to many different uh, conversations, is because us uh, can be anything. It can be, us can be your family. Us can be your class. Us can be your country. I use a lot of United States imagery in, in, in this movie. And I wanted to explore the, the fact that when you have us, you have a them. And the way we think about them uh, is tends to be less than the way we think about us. And this is one of these uh, innately human pieces of, of duality that I, think, I, I consider a social demon. It's something that if we don't address, it's going to uh, lead us towards committing atrocity together. I believe conversation is the greatest tool we have against our evils and the evils of the world. So when I see a missing piece of the conversation about evil that is in our DNA, I want to make that point. I want to do it kind of mischievously. I want to do it in a fun way. Um, I want to do it in a way that is, you know, will attract a group of people to come and experience it together, to make noise together, and to feel that together. It helps arm us with uh, some, a new vocabulary for the conversation. I reference the Bible and, and this idea of spirituality um, in both of these movies because I, I love to deal with the, the duality of the, the science versus religion, um, you know, conundrum. And point out these, invent these uh, abominations that comes when we try to reconcile the two of them together. Um, so, you know, the, the, the biblical reference, you know, among many things, is about that, and it is about that this is a story of the rising of a Messiah. That's a great segue to let's look at and exploring that Messiah, Lupita. <laughs> See, we've seen you in films, we've grown to love you and your work, um, and typically your roles have been supported roles and you've gotten great accolades for that. So it was wondering what was it like for you to sort of experience the script where you're the central figure? First of all, I just want to say that this is definitely my first time in Howard. And, so <laughs> and it's also my first time visiting an HBCU. So <laughs> with this film, with these two, with Jordan Peele. Oh, yes, I know that one. <laughs> I'm filled with gratitude for the journey that I've been on in the last six years since I started uh, being a professional actor. Uh, with 12 Years a Slave and all, the, <laughs> and all the accolades that came with the recognition, what it afforded me was the gift of choice and I could really sit back and think about what I wanted to lend my artistry to. And I always wanted to do stuff that mattered, stuff that challenged me, stuff that made me grow, and so I've chosen carefully, and that's why you've seen me in the movies that I've chosen thus far. Uh, shout out to Black Panther. It's been a long time coming, and uh, I feel like the stars aligned for my first lead role to be with Jordan Peele. Yes. Uh, because I watched his film Get Out five times in one month, and I was just taken by his precision, his vision, his, his you know, um, his inner compass that helped him tell that story. You know, what he talks about in that film, the fact that he makes racism the monster that it is in a horror film and makes it a journey that is so exciting to go on and makes you think, he, think he, he, he really trusts his audience to bring their intelligence to the watching of a movie. I felt so respected watching that film, so dignified as a film, as, a, as an audience member because he just, 
gave us something expecting the best of us. And so, you know, when he came to me and uh, offered me this part, I said yes for a number of reasons, to work with him, but also because he gave me two well-rounded, three-dimensional women to sink my teeth into. And with this film, again, he's tackling issues that are so intrinsic to the human experience, you know? And uh, he's doing so with swag. Both roles were so, so, such a departure from anything I'd done to date, and they stretched me as an artist and let me grow. So for all those reasons, I feel like this is how it was meant to be, and I, I'm very proud. To that, it, uh, sort of what did you have to do to prepare? Because it was madness, I won't lie. I mean, yeah, it was, I, I was preparing for this in the time it usually takes me to prepare for one role. And here I had these two roles that are just so different from each other. And you know, as an actor, you take on a role and you become the advocate for that character. You see things the way they see it. But here I was being asked to do that and also be the judge of both characters. So what I think it ended up doing is, um, you know, stretching me to my elastic limit. He promised me that I would be tired. He delivered on that promise. I was very exhausted making this film. But it was about uh, finding the precision and physicality and, in, and the emotionality and psychology of these women. So, you know, for Adelaide, she's a, a ballet dancer, and so I took ballet classes <clears throat> to get remnants of that in my body and for red you know there was a line in the script that said she hadn't used her voice for a very long time and for me that was just you know creative fodder like what would that sound like and so i happened upon a condition known as spasmodic dysphonia which is a causes a spasming of the vocal folds and built off of that uh, and it's usually caused by trauma, so it just felt really apt to, to, to be inspired by that. And then he said she moved like a queen and a cockroach, you know, there was something about that in her physicality. So, you know, just working on that kind of precise, surprising, skittery kind of thing. It was so much fun, you know, to, to have an opportunity to play such, um, you know, distinct and wildly imaginative characters. Uh, I wanted to ask you sort of, we're often used to seeing, you know, men, African American men or black men with physical prowess in these different roles, superheroes or villains. But um, what was it like for you to play, at least as Gabriel, the fun-loving character? What was that experience like? Um, well, that was a great question. Uh, thanks for having us. Um, <laughs> A really strong part of what Jordan Peele does is he loves taking things that we find familiar and turning it on its head. Am I right? Um, from five on it and turning that into something just. I would never hear that song in the same way. Creepy, <laughs> you know? Um, powerful. Um, and what we wanted to do, we had conversations about just changing how we look at masculinity in film. Um, taking something that feels incredibly familiar like the sitcom dad, and all these, you know, to some degree, respectability politics dads and performances, and turning it into something that says something. So taking figures that feel like Uncle Phil from Fresh Prince, or taking, you know, even Homer Simpson, or, you know, that Seaver dad from Growing Pains. And, you know, because the thing about Gabe Wilson is he also performs, to some degree, a veneer of whiteness. Right? And, oh, it's starting to be like church up in here. <laughs> Well, I will ask you to expound upon yeah. that. What do you mean by Yeah, he performs, a, it's a, a bit of a veneer of whiteness because he's really attached to the construct of the American dream. He really defines himself in his possessions, right? He, he defines himself in the home, in the car, in the trophy family. Oh. Um, he really defines himself in his possessions. And we wanted to take something that felt really familiar. So 
the audience can find it palatable, and then you get home and you go, that actually doesn't feel right in my stomach, right? That character who doesn't listen, is that really the all-American dad, right? Uh, the father who doesn't listen, the husband who isn't really a partner, is that the all-American dad? And that's the thing about Gay Wilson, is that we were flipping a lot of things, and we're aware that we were flipping a lot of things. Because even though he is this character who is defined by like patriarchy and is the head of the family and I must be listened to until he isn't listened to. Um, he's also defined in action that isn't your typical male in film. He's not your typical black male in film. He's not your typical male in cinema. He is not stoic and uncommunicative. He is overly communicative. He can be a bit sexy, and he can be... Yes! Y'all are gonna create a monster. <laughs> but he can be funny, and he can be so many things at once, and he can be self-defining to some degree, and he can change. It's hard to uh, intellectualize each and every choice, when, because on a certain point, you know, when it works, it works. You know, music is, tends to be there. Score is there to underline emotion. You know, the same image can mean two different things with two different scores. Um, you know, when I use these, these pop culture kind of iconic tracks, um, you know, part of my uh, desire is exploring this idea of duality and, and bringing a new meaning, you know, showing the underbelly of something that is that is popular and that has this, you know, a positive connotation to us already. Um, so that you know, when I do the needle drops, like even you know, even the Beach Boys, Good Vibrations, yeah. um, the Minnie Riperton song at the end, the floor, yes. it's all about taking these uh, anthems of good feeling and ruining them. <laughs> <laughs> well, you do it masterfully, and I think. Um, you know, just like your tension between humor and horror is just, I think, replete in the, the technique and the ways in which you do that is brilliant. So it was the American dream. I'm an immigrant man living in this, in this country. So I got to redefine the American dream for myself through my own lens as both an actor and through the lens of my character. And that, when I left set every day, I felt powerful. When you get to redefine words and put them into your own context and understand them in an individual way, I think that empowers you. And what I love about Jordan Peele's movies and what we make and made was that we're having a conversation with people, but we're, by doing so, I know my own personal mission is to empower everyone that I'm around. I'm, I'm trying to empower my audience. I'm trying to empower young minds. I'm trying to empower everyone that's consuming the work that I'm doing by giving them that same thing, an opportunity to find words that they encounter for themselves. So I think when you get to like change symbolism, you get to redefine it, and that's a really powerful thing. idea of what is my obligation to the world and, what the, and to the community and 
what what is what am I inspired to do? Which might you know on the surface be irres feel irresponsible. The notion you know you take something like Get Out. The notion of creating entertainment around our suffering was is irresponsible when you think about it at first. And it was only through nurturing that and uh, paying attention to that and saying, how do I bring this expression responsibly that I ended up with this, the, this piece that really worked and, and spoke to people, was, was treating people like they are their smartest, best selves. Just loving my audience. So how do you feel after this movie? This one, yo, it's top five. It, it's top five. Top two, and it's not two. Listen, like you need y'all. It's the a movie. plot twist, and y'all really are not gonna expect it. Do I'm not about to blow nothing up, but just not. Know. Pay attention. Reveal the plot. Go support no, no, no. the movie and March watch it like 22nd. four times. Yep. You gotta pay attention the whole movie. You need to watch for everything. Don't go Just, to the back. Pee nope, beforehand. Get your popcorn before. Listen to the music. Watch. The pay symbols, attention to the beginning. That. It's not the gonna very, make. Very very beginning. But it's gonna make sense at the end of the movie, bro. Top <laughs> top two and it's not number two. Definitely. Okay, so I just got back from the screening and honestly, it was amazing. Like. No words. Honestly, I already said this, but go watch it. But yeah, this is the end of this video. So I hope you guys liked what you saw. And yeah, bye.